Good evening and welcome to The Naked Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Sean Wise, Professor of Entrepreneurship at Ryerson University. Each week, The Naked Entrepreneur features an entrepreneur who's made it big in business. This week, our guest is Derek Ball. Derek Ball is a serial technology entrepreneur, an author of over a dozen books and an internationally noted speaker. I've known Derek since 1999 and has watched his ups, his downs, and his comebacks for more than a decade. Derek Ball and his team at Tint have revolutionized the way that data is shared on the internet. Tint has grown to be one of the top data aggregators in the world with more than one billion unique users. After selling Tint last year, Derek is already on his way to founding his next great venture. My name is Lindsay Goodchild. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Green Gage. Jonathan Trump, founder and creative director of Tokyo Mouse Inc. Mark Coleman, the co-founder and president of WebRocker. No matter what the idea, be it product or service, profit or nonprofit, Ryerson provides education, resources, and funding to help start and expand your businesses. Relationships with other entrepreneurs can be a huge factor in your success. You may see that rock. And is it a diamond or not? How would you know? Talking with other entrepreneurs can help you know. Welcome back to The Naked Entrepreneur. Our guest tonight, serial entrepreneur, Derek Ball. Derek, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Sean. Now, Derek, you and I have known each other for about 10 years, but I want to go back even farther. I want to go back to your earliest days in Toronto. Right? So you're born in Toronto, but then you don't stay there. In the, in the next uh, 15 years, you end up moving to 16 different houses. Did your parents not pay rent or did they, were they on the lamb from the authorities? Why did you move so much and what do you think that did to you in those early years? Uh, witness protection program. Uh, no, I actually, I'm not entirely sure why we moved so much. My mom always said my dad was a gypsy. Uh, and uh, he worked for a bank and the bank transferred him around on a regular basis. Uh, uh, so we found ourselves moving all over Canada. And uh, I think that as far as the impact it had on me, uh, I learned, I think, to be uh, have to enter new environments with confidence. And I learned to make friends very quickly, uh, although the, uh, the downside of it was I don't have those long-term friends from childhood because I never stayed long enough to actually uh, make that kind of thing stick. Do you think that's been easier for you in your later years as you've had to move back on both sides of the border several times? We're going to talk about exits and, and having to relocate, but do you think that's had a long-term effect? I'm sure it has. It's kind of hard. As I don't have the other experience, it's harder for me to, to, uh, to, to relate to. But I certainly know that when you're an entrepreneur, you have to do what it takes. And that often means traveling to the markets where your customers are, traveling to where the, uh, the, the center of the universe may be for the segment that you're operating in, and being willing to spend time out of your, your comfort zone, out of your hometown. And so I think growing up and being in a state of almost constant relocation, it certainly made it easier for me to, uh, to, to enjoy that uh, lifestyle. It's interesting. I wonder what that sort of made you ready for in the future, the chaos of entrepreneurship. But I want to talk about finding your market and finding your sort of first market, your first segment. I want to take you back, way back, to when you're six years old. So we had a producer call your family and they tell us here that at age six you had garage sales on your front lawn in an attempt to sell your toys. True or false? <laughs> and what was that about? Uh, true, and I was uh, looking to make some money to buy new toys, and I thought those other kids would give me money for my old toys, and I, with that I could uh, upgrade myself. And what did you learn from that early experience? Uh, that I seemed to have a bit of an ability to sell. <laughs> and that uh, uh, certainly I, I was, uh, I think I took some lessons from Tom Sawyer, or remember those books, The Great Brain, in that I liked finding out uh, when somebody wanted something, what was the maximum margin I could extract from the situation. So how much economic rent you could get out if the toy was hot, if it was a Tickle Me Elmo, maybe you could get more than if it was a grouchy Grover. Exactly. Okay. Now, 
these early days led you to want to be an entrepreneur, but by 21 you had sort of turned your mind away from that. What caused you at 21 to have this little blip in your life where you thought maybe corporate world in Europe was a better idea? Well, I mean, I'd always been in the entrepreneur. I'd always created my own companies, my own jobs. Uh, I'd always been self-employed uh, for the most part. But then I actually, and I paid my way through university. I had got a degree in finance. Uh, they didn't offer an entrepreneurship degree at my my school at the time. I would have loved it if they did. The uh, uh, and uh, I got the degree, and everybody that I knew was interviewing for jobs, and I got a job offer in Zurich from Citicorp, and I thought, that sounds like an interesting experience. I've never lived in Europe before, and I just got this degree. I guess I should go put it to use. And so I went out, and I found myself all of a sudden uh, being a banker. And although it was a great experience for me to live there and experience that, I, it just further cemented in my mind that that was not the path I was meant to be on. Now, you and I met, I think, if we go back far enough, 98, 99. You were with Sonic Mobility. I think it was at the Bant Venture Fair. But I want to take people back to the founding of Sonic Mobility and what made you want to work in that space and, and what really led you to that first sort of, this is the business I want to launch. Sure. Uh, so Sonic Mobility wasn't the first startup that I was involved in. Uh, I was in, It was the first one that I was a founder of. Uh, I had gotten involved uh, in a startup during the tail end of the dot-com boom, and it was a Silicon Valley headquartered startup, and I got a bit of a taste for the whole space, but uh, uh, I wasn't the one running the show there. I was running uh, op, uh, research and development and product development for this company in Silicon Valley. And uh, we, you know, when the dot-com implosion happened, we imploded with it. But I, at that point now, I was fully hooked on the whole industry and the business. And it was time to you know, really stick my neck out and do one uh, that I was going to take the reins of. So hold, on, so hold on, hold on, hold on. So the whole world implodes. People go from a billion dollars to zero. You're at a Silicon Valley funded company. It implodes and you decide, you know what I should do? I should double down. I should take even more <laughs> risk and I should put my neck on. Why when everyone else was running from the dot coms, from entrepreneurship, were you running into entrepreneurship well, in your own startup? And there's one thing I believe is a common trait amongst almost all entrepreneurs and that is a, a, a delusional level of optimism. A delusional uh, level of optimism. And, and I think it's a necessary element for to ultimately succeed as an entrepreneur because you have to believe that there's an opportunity that exists where most rational people don't believe there is one. And uh, even after the dot-com bust, uh, I believe there were tremendous market opportunities. Anytime something significant is happening in the market, which these days is almost constantly, there it creates opportunities. It's and, the change that causes the opportunity. Exactly. And so in that particular situation, the change I saw that really excited me was the growth of mobile devices. Now, actually, I started Sonic in December of 2000. And the, uh, the state-of-the-art mobile device at the time was a BlackBerry two-way pager. It didn't even run on an IP network. It ran on the uh, two-way paging networks, the Reflex. And the so for those people who don't remember, Research in Motion is a Canadian company, or at least maybe at the time that this is aired. And back in the day, they started the first wireless email was actually a pager device that you could just see one line at a time. And that made exactly. you think that that's the future. And I thought that these things are amazing. And the, the, uh, the other player in the space was Compaq, which is now owned by HP. And they had produced their next generation link called an iPack. And it was this large device uh, with a touch screen. And it was a, uh, it was a bit like an iPad mini, but uh, it didn't have wireless connectivity. You had to plug it into a giant sled with an extended battery pack and a big antenna in order to get that thing to work. And my vision was that these things were going to get smaller. Everybody would carry one. And it was going to be so important to have these things uh, uh, do th uh, communicate in real time with a variety of different so things. So in 2002, you thought the future was mobile and, and everyone might one day have a smartphone in their pocket. Gee, right, and that was wrong. Yeah, that's right. So that was 2000. Everybody called me crazy. And that's, that was the delusional optimism was that in 2000, I said, uh, they said these things will only be in the realms of executives and IT people and a few select people. I was like, no, everyone's going to have one of these. Uh, but And I started to build out platforms that would run on these connected wireless devices. And uh, very quickly, I had to pivot the platform towards somebody that would actually pay for it. So hold and on, so let's stop there because there's a lesson there. So are you suggesting that what you first bought wasn't what everyone wanted to purchase? <laughs> yeah, go figure. Uh, exactly. 
And in fact, when Sonic Mobility first started, my plan was to apply this technology uh, into the same day courier business because I saw FedEx and UPS had these fancy tablets that they'd spent uh, hundreds of millions of dollars building out the platform so they could capture signatures and people delivered packages. But the same day courier still had slips of paper. And my thought was I could replace the paper very, you know, you go Steve Blank, where are people using paper, Excel spreadsheets, fax machines to solve problems as an industry. And the same day courier industry relied on little slips of paper, which then got filed at the end of the day into big boxes of paper. And when somebody wanted proof of delivery, somebody had to go back into one of these big boxes of paper and find the slip and then courier the slip over to the person. Uh, and so I looked at that and said, there's an opportunity. And I began to uh, you know, have my team build a solution out towards that problem. But as we went out, and at the time, it's funny, we, we didn't use the terminology that Steve, or that Steve Blank has evolved around this now uh, of validation and, uh, and discovery. But we, it's what we really did is I went out and I started speaking to the same day courier companies and they, they loved it. So you did customer uh, development, what we now right. call customer development. Exactly. And, uh, and so one of the interesting things that I remember reading in one of uh, Steve Blank's uh, blog posts, I think I'm sure it's in his books now, uh, was that uh, uh, a key thing was, will people actually pay for it? And so that became the next step as we began to build this platform. And then I went to these couriers and tried to get them to pay for the product. And I realized they made so much, so little money on each delivery, they couldn't afford to pay for my solution. And so I was building a product for a market that had no money. Uh, so bad decision. So we had to decide uh, what could we do with what we had. And we realized that uh, uh, we could use this infrastructure we'd created to allow people, IT people in particular, to use these mobile devices to control servers, switches, routers, and hubs, and manage data centers from a mobile device. Uh, and having been an IT guy in one of my uh, in fact, when you're a startup, you're often your own IT guy. <laughs> so having to manage my servers remotely and then turn around and drive back to the office to reboot systems when they wouldn't work. Or, uh, so I, Sonic's I, second kind of iteration was, could we use these as tools to stop IT people from having to come in in the middle of the night? Could we cut down on the HR costs to support networks? Exactly. And the great thing was the people that actually had these devices at the time, military, government, banks, uh, were people that had money and experienced the pain. And they were willing to pay me to put a solution onto their devices which would allow them to make the pain go away. Now, you not only had traction with customers and big customers, you also attracted two rounds of funding, if I'm not mistaken, maybe more now, um, for Sonic Mobility. There was an angel investment, there was a venture capital investment. Now, it doesn't sound that rare, but for Alberta companies, which weren't oil and gas, that was incredibly rare. How did it feel to sort of garner that level of attention, that level of validation? Sure, well, Sean, so those, those financing rounds occurred in my next company, which was called Tint. Uh, the Sonic Mobility did raise angel money. Okay, and angel. When we went forward to actually uh, uh, raise our Series A, we had a term sheet on the table for the Series A from a company called, uh, a BC called Blueprint Ventures in Silicon Valley. They're not around anymore. And at the as part of that, we'd gone forward to one of our strategic partners to say, would you like to participate in this round that's being led by this VC? And they looked at the round and they looked at the price, the, the, the valuation that was being set in the company in the round and said, you know, for that price, can we just buy you guys? And uh, I said, cash? And they said, yes. And so I said, okay. <laughs> and we sold the company to them. Once again, uh, the money talks and we all start to walk. Exactly. Uh, it was a great return for my angel investors. I never raised venture capital into Sonic Mobility. Uh, but with Tint, which was my next startup after Sonic, yes, I uh, initially raised angel money. Then I did an A round that was a, led by a Montreal venture capital firm called Inovia Capital. Yeah. And then uh, we did a B round that had multiple VC participants raising an additional $8 million into the company uh, in 2008, which was also a challenging time to raise money. I seem to like to pick these really bad times in the market to go raise I wanna, funds. I'm going to talk to you about that because you seem to want to do things when it's even harder to do them. You want to raise money when it's a cold market. You want to make ice cream in the middle of the desert. But we're go we'll, we'll get there in a second. I want ask you a common question and our students don't really always have this perspective. Do you feel that funding is a validation? Do you feel that by raising eight million dollars or four million dollars or even five hundred thousand that it's proving to you that you're not the only crazy person who thinks this is a potential success? Or do you think that founders often mistake investment for third-party traction? 
<laughs> it, it is actually surprising to me how many entrepreneurs I run into that think they've won the game when they raise capital. Uh, all you've done when you raise capital is you've raised the stakes of the game and put a lot more stress back onto your shoulders. Uh, the uh, and that sounds crazy because a lot of the the uh, I mentor a lot of startups and a lot of times when, and they haven't raised capital and they think that they, once they get capital that life will be easy and it'll be it'll be on easy street. Uh, when in fact when you once you've raised the money it gets even harder. Now you have some tools at your disposal you didn't have to execute with before raising the capital, but uh, uh, now all of a sudden you have new business partners in your venture. You have uh, a very clear, you know, you have you have a lot of uh, a very clear focus on how much runway you actually have, and so you start counting the money as, as it dissipates. So you you know how many months out you can last. Exactly, but there's also uh, a, a very clear concept, which a lot of entrepreneurs don't grasp at the beginning, which is this, the exit pyramid. And that is, as you raise more money, these investors are going to expect a return on their investment and your exit value that you create, if you're going for an M&A type of exit, uh, has to be that much higher. So the more money you raise, the bigger the number you have to sell for. So the let's just stop there because I don't think everyone follows that. So I agree with you. If you raise a million dollars, then maybe your investor's okay getting 10 million, 20 million back. If you raise 20 million, then you may have to, just to keep pace, give back 200 to 500 million. The problem is the number of companies that can buy you for 500 million, a billion, are very few as opposed to the 20 million, the 30 million sales. Which why, why I think a lot of people choose angel money over VC now, because they prefer to have an earlier exit. What do you think? Uh, that's, that's bang on. And in fact, the, uh, uh, as, you know, right now I'm starting a brand new venture. It is literally uh, months old. And uh, it is very, not only lean startup, it's lean financing. Because you know, the, uh, uh, the less you can bring in, the more flexibility you have with the decisions you're going to make in the future regarding potential exits. Uh, if you've brought in 20, uh, well, for example, into Tint, I brought in $13 million of venture capital. And that meant that the exit bar all of a sudden got quite high. And uh, now, fortunately, we hurdled the exit bar. <laughs> but the, well, uh, You skyrocketed over the exit bar, but we'll get there too. Let's go back to your finishing up at Sonic Mobility. I know you're mentoring a bunch of companies at the Calgary Incubator, but you decide to come up with Tint. Tell me about why you looked your wife in the eyes and said, you know, Sonic Mobility was so much fun. Let's do it again. <laughs> In fact, one of the things I, one of the days I, I remember at Sonic Mobility was, uh, uh, as you go, as oh, everybody, one of your students, every one of your students, there ventures out into the world and decides they want to take on uh, something entrepreneurial. It is a roller coaster ride, and you've heard that from everybody, and you'll experience it yourself firsthand. Uh, and you'll have your up days and your down days. And everyone, one of the down days, and I've always tried very hard to insulate my family from the ups and the downs of the roller coaster. Uh, but I remember one time my wife saying to me, "So if this one doesn't work, would you?" please just get a job. <laughs> and, uh, and that was when I knew I had to make it work because I knew I couldn't survive in a job. You'd finished up at Sonic Mobility. You're working as a mentor at the Calgary Technologies uh, Incubator Park. And you go to your wife and said, let's do it again. I got this great <laughs> idea for a tint. And she says, so the good news is she says you're crazy, uh, and she, uh, but she knows I'm crazy. She married crazy, and that's what she's going to – and she's, she's stuck with it. Uh, but the good thing is that you know, because Sonic Mobility was a successful exit, I now had a little bit of cushion to go out and continue to play. Uh, so I launched the, the, the uh, mentoring at uh, – which is now Innovate Calgary. used to be called Calgary Technologies – was wonderful. I got to meet a lot of great entrepreneurs, but I looked at them and, and in my strange, twisted way, I said, why are they getting to have all the fun? <laughs> and I said, so I decided it was time to get back in the game. Besides, I'd, I prefer being a player to being a coach anyways. Uh, so, the, uh, uh, so we jumped in and we created Tint. And Tint was trying to change the world. I wanted to build something which uh, was, not, was less of a niche product. That I wanted something that was going to touch everybody on the planet. So when I remember hearing that phone call and I said, yes, Derek, you're crazy. You're going to start again. If I remember the original pitch, it had something to do with meta tagging websites. It had something to do with annotating. So when I visited a site, I could not only see what the site's owners put out, but I could see what people in my network had commented and left notes. But I wasn't there as often as you were. Why don't you tell me, what was the problem originally you were trying to address with Tint? So the original problem was I felt that... Uh, 
uh, people would like to have conversations about content they find on the web, particularly around social networks. Uh, and I thought you know, my, my use case was essentially a teenage girl sees cute boy's profile on social network. She wants to have a conversation with a couple of her other teenage girls uh, about this boy. And so right on top of his profile page, we allowed them to annotate, mark it up. They could even dress him in clothing, put hats on his head, speech bubbles. And it was meant to be a fun, interactive, dynamic platform uh, targeting teenage users. How did that turn out for you? Uh, a, a huge failure. <laughs> we, uh, but hold on. Let's not just laugh that off. What do you mean by a huge failure? You burned millions of dollars. You offended people. You were banned from certain countries. What do you mean failure? So at this point, we'd only raised angel capital. We hadn't gone into our first VC round yet. Uh, so we and we had burned through capital to build this because uh, even then it wasn't as easy to build these things as it is today. Uh, we uh, we tested it out. We, you know, as part of trying to validate this, we went and asked teenage girls, would you use this? Would this be fun? They all said yes. We did focus groups and they loved it. Uh, and then we put the product out there and it just didn't really go. <laughs> and uh, so we took a step back and said, well, what's wrong with this? Well, we, maybe it's because it requires you to ins you install a plugin in your browser and nobody installs plugins in browsers. Only, uh, so maybe we need to have a way to integrate it to the website. So we went to what at the time was Canada's largest teen social network, bigger than Facebook. It was a company in Edmonton called Nexopia. And we made a partnership with Nexopia and they embedded our platform into their platform. So it became something you didn't even have to install. You showed up on somebody's social profile and you could begin to uh, create this layer like Photoshop on top of the uh, uh, on top of the page. And we thought, now that there's no installs, this is going to be great. People are going to love it. And the, uh, Nexopia promoted it. The, the initial user said, hey, this is really cool. And then the usage went up and then it went down. And what we learned was the product wasn't inherently sticky. Although, you know, all the kids told us they loved it and gave us all the right answers, they didn't keep using it. Uh, so for us, the, uh, the realization that this was just simply not working. And one of the things that, uh, you know, if you look, read Seth Godin and others, it's when do you decide to pivot? When is it that, because... You know, you're talking about Seth Godin, uh, the, the dip, right? How do you know when you're at the bottom of the life cycle and you're on your way back up? Or how do you know when you're at the bottom of the life cycle and about to die? Exactly. And, the, and the, the, the bottom line is you don't know, <laughs> but you have to trust your instincts and make some decisions. And in that particular decision, I wasn't seeing anything that was going to give me any confidence that we were going to get this one to click and that maybe we just fundamentally uh, misunderstood the teenage user we were targeting. But, you know, in, in a very fortunate parallel, I'd been approached by some, some magazine publishers who had published uh, content for teenage users. And they saw our platform in Nexopia and said, you know what, we'd like to try to use your platform to encourage teens to engage in conversations on the content we're publishing. And it was through those discussions we started to have with these publishers, we realized that the teens were already engaging in discussions around the content. But what they were doing was copying and pasting the content into their social networks and having the conversation there. And they really had no idea how to measure that or engage with it, uh, or even they had no context, context for it all. And so we said, well, maybe we can help with that. Maybe we can use some of the technology we developed to track and measure what's being copied uh, where is it being pasted and what level of conversation is going on around the content and to make sure that those people that are having conversations off your site can find their way back. And so the, uh, uh, that gave birth to the new Tint product, which became a tool for publishers on the web to measure what people were copying and distributing through social networks as well, and, and email. And that one was a Big success. Uh, yeah. How did you measure when you see again? We talked about failure and knowing when something was a failure. How did you know it was a success? Well, this one was interesting because we, first of all, a, a friend of mine, uh, you've heard of you know, Guy Kawasaki out of the, the Valley here. But he, uh, I went to, to Guy and I said, uh, here's, you know, he loved the first product and he was helping me out with it. And I said, we're going to change the whole company and go to this new idea. And he goes, it's stupid. He says, nobody copies and pastes on the internet. And I said, well, let me plug this little piece of technology into your website, Guy, and let's see what's happening. And we plugged it in on his website, and, and, uh, and it was giving him a very raw stream of what was being copied off of his own website. 
And he came to me uh, about an hour after it was live and said, your software is obviously broken. It says that 90 people have copied from my website in the last 60 minutes. And I said, actually, they have. And you know, here's their IP addresses, here's what they copied, and here's what they did with it. And, yeah, and it completely converted him. Uh, but for me, when I knew we were succeeding, we originally went out to Guy and about a dozen people I knew who had websites, and we had them deploy our test code. And uh, then we decided that uh, the test code was robust enough. We would uh, ask, a few f ask them if they had a few friends who'd be willing to deploy this for us as well. And I hoped I would get 50 sites to participate in our beta. Uh, the, between, you know, we had 50 sites basically asked to be in the beta. Uh, in the first 24 hours, we'd put the request out. And we closed, it was a closed beta. You couldn't come and just grab the code and deploy it. And I started getting emails. And within three weeks, I had a thousand sites that had contacted me asking to deploy our code. Uh, and that's when I had a good feeling that we were on the right track. So we opened up the, uh, the sign up process and made it a public beta and anybody could come and download the code. And it went from a thousand sites to 10,000 sites. Uh, and it just continued to rocket up to the point where we were on 650,000 publishers, including uh, every major newspaper and magazine in North. Well, didn't I read that, that you had more than a billion unique people track, so a billion people interacted with code that you had provided to all of these publishers. Is that right, a billion, more than a billion? One and a quarter billion unique uh, individuals that we tracked anonymously uh, across the internet, yes. Wow, so you run Tint for five years. Again, someone knocks on your door, they want to acquire it. Tell me about that decision. Now you're running a business, you're VC backed, you've got finally the traction you always want, and where were you thinking when they were knocking on your door? Uh, well, it's always very flattering to be told you're the pretty girl to dance. Uh, the, uh, uh, so when the, when the uh, uh, CEO of the company that acquired us came asking if we would be open to an acquisition, uh, your job as CEO, especially when you have investors, is to always say, we'd certainly consider that. <laughs> uh, and, but at that you know, point, you weren't looking to shop it. You were happy with the way it was tracking. You were happy with the adoption. Your monetization plan was starting to formulate. So what are you thinking when people are coming to, to possibly exit? Are you thinking, now I can give back the VCs their money, it's too early, it's too late? Well, and it, with this one, uh, you know, because, it, because I was, you know, fortunately had had an exit before, I wasn't hungry to, uh, uh, to try to cash out. And so the exit this time I looked at with, you know, through different lenses than I'd looked at before. Uh, there is definitely, it was, are we maximizing what we do in terms of creating uh, A, the value for the shareholders, and B, is tint all that it can be. And one of the things that I learned as we really broke down and analyzed this was that in order for tint to make its move to that next level up the next rung up the ladder, uh, the data that we were amassing was really only useful in one place. Uh, there was only one way to monetize the data, and it was through targeting, using the data to target advertising. And that was not my background. So if I was going to pursue building out a socially targeted ad network, that would mean I would probably have to go and raise another 15 to $20 million. I'd have to hire a whole new group of executives, uh, hire another 50 people onto the team, and it'd probably take me 18 months or longer to ramp that business up. Uh, or in this case, uh, I could find somebody who had built that part of the business extremely well, but didn't have the data and the technology to support the business that they had built. Uh, and the, the acquirer who was knocking on the door at the time had exactly that. They had incredible ad sales, ad operations, ad delivery team. They were buying their data from third parties and they didn't have an adequate supply uh, or a high enough quality of data to make their systems really work well. So it, uh, it ended up being a match made in heaven. Uh, but we certainly weren't looking for the deal. And when, I, when we realized that we could put these two pieces together and two plus two was really going to equal eight, uh, it just really did make sense. Now, when it's part of this transaction, you had to relocate from your home and native land and once, ago, once again go south of the border. How is that from a family side? You've got three young girls, you've got a very loving wife, but moving around, lots of ups and downs. To walk us through that. For sure. And that actually happened before the transaction. I moved down here about two years ago and uh, it was a family decision. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you have to go where you have to go to get stuff done. Uh, 
and that means stepping out of your bubble, be it uh, Calgary or uh, or you know, uh, Dan Martell out of Moncton is a good example. He's you know, though he lives and starts his businesses up in Moncton, he spends more time in San Francisco, I think, than anywhere else. Dan Martell of I think uh, maple syrup, maple butter, maple butter. Maple Butter, he was a co-founder of Spheric, that uh, was a you know, great uh, success story, and then Flowtown, that was acquired by Demand, uh, uh, Demand Force. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the key point being, I was doing what I needed to do. I was, uh, most of my publishers, the, the, the publishing world lives and breathes in New York. So I was in New York one week every month. Uh, and then the tech world still lives and breathes out of mostly San Francisco, Silicon Valley area. So I was down in the Valley for a week a month. And then it got to the point where I was in New York for a week and Silicon Valley for two weeks and then New York a week, then Silicon Valley for three weeks. And, uh, finally I came home and my wife said, okay, Silicon Valley or Manhattan, pick one. We're moving. We'll see more of you that way. <laughs> and, uh, and that was a sign of the success that the company was having that I just needed to be in these places to get done what needed to get done. So uh, we decided, you know what, it'll be an adventure. Let's try it out. So we moved down, and uh, for us, it's been great. Now, I've, I, I've been asked to comment frequently, can tech companies be started in Canada? Of course they can. Tech companies can be started and grown successfully anywhere. Uh, but you have to be prepared to, uh, as, the, as the, the founder or executive in the company, to go where you need to go to get business done. So... Walk me through how these two paradigms in your life interact. I know personally you have a very family-first attitude. You're very much a dedicated family person, and, and they come very high on your list. But having worked with you for a long time, I also know that you have a win-at-all-costs startup mentality, do what needs to get done, roll up your sleeves, tighten your skates, and get going. So how do you make those balance? How do you make those work? How do you tell our students in the audience that you can have it all? Uh, well, I, you know, I think that uh, you can, and there's and one of the funny things you see down here in the valley is there's been this long stand, and people have written a lot about this, but there's been this long standing uh, myth that you have to be two guys getting out of Harvard uh, or Stanford, and uh, you're going to work 23 hours a day and sleep under your desk. Uh, I don't buy into that. Uh, I think that you have to when you when you're an, when you're an entrepreneur and you're founding your own startup it's in your blood you don't punch in at eight and punch out at five uh, it's something that goes on in your mind and in your life all the time but it doesn't mean it's the only thing that goes on in your life and the uh, the great thing for me so i have three daughters 15 years old 13 years old and nine years old and they are you know Definitely one, you know, my top priority. You know, we, uh, I take, I mean, teaching them how to surf, we ski all the time, we live a really good integrated life. But they also know that uh, uh, everything's a trade off. You know, when we, I don't believe when you're an entrepreneur, you ever really unplug from your business because it's not just a business, it's your life, it's part of who you are. So we take great holidays. We go down to, we were uh, recently in Honduras and the Bay Islands and, uh, when we go down there, we've been down there a few times now. Uh, I, my computer will come with me. I don't work all day, but I will spend an hour and I'll check to make sure that things are under control. And uh, uh, but then I get the rest of the time to go and enjoy being with the family. And you know, if my kids have a play on at school in the middle of the day, I can always be there. Uh, and it's just a matter of all these blocks will fit together really well when you realize that one is not more important than the other. Uh, but, and both deserve equal footing in your life, but, uh, you can do it. We have a lot of people in the audience here who are thinking that one day they might want to grow up to follow in your footsteps. What kind of advice can you give our students who are just coming out of the entrepreneurship program? They're just rolling up their sleeves. They're trying to figure out what opportunity to pursue. Look back, look back at where you were 20 years ago. What advice can you pass on? Uh, Success is always about relationships, first of all. Uh, it doesn't matter how good your idea is, how smart you are, how hard you're willing to work. Uh, so much of success comes down to your ability to genuinely form strong relationships. Uh, there have been an incredible number of people who have helped me along my path uh, with the businesses that I've built. And I look back at you know, what, what made things successful. 
Was it that we really had the better product or that we worked harder than our competition or that uh, it was always about the people, both on my teams and the people that I interacted with all the time. So I would say that one of the key things you want to be doing is, is just whenever you can find an exceptional person, stay in touch with that person. Uh, I mean, for, I was very lucky early in my career to run into a fellow named Dick Auchinleck. And Dick is, uh, uh, he was started off as a chemical engineer at uh, Gulf Petroleum. He ended up as CEO of Gulf and then sold Gulf to ConocoPhillips for an unbelievable amount of money for the shareholders. And now he's, he's on the board of ConocoPhillips Global. Uh, and I just feel very fortunate to count him as a friend. He was actually vice chairman at my company, Sonic Mobility. Uh, and, uh, uh, he's just been an incredible mentor and friend, uh, and I've uh, and I and I when I find uh, or have the f- good fortune to run into people like that, you hang on to them and you keep talking to them and you make those relationships work, and uh, they will help you, ex- you know, t- take your crazy ideas and make them not so crazy. I think that's great advice, and I know we're going to open it up to student questions in just a minute, but I, I really wanted to end with this question, which I find my students ask often. You talked earlier today about the ups and the downs, the good days and the bad days. You also talked about how when it's a bad day, you don't necessarily know, is this the last bad day before the pivot or before we close the door? How do you personally still deal with your bad days? Even though you have lots of external success, I think your family life is a great success, your personal accomplishments are great, but you still get kicked in the stomach once in a while. You still have things not go the way you want. What advice can you give to them today from your perspective on dealing with those bad days? Uh, I think the bit, (laughs) good question. And persistence is, and so after, after relationships, persistence is going to be the thing that will get you through because you are, you will have many bad days. Uh, and when you have those bad days, remember that you're going to have great days too. Uh, and so when you have those bad days, always remember the good ones. Yeah. And that there will be more good ones in the future, but you don't quit. Uh, you don't hang up the gloves. You don't walk away. The entrepreneurs who succeed go through devastatingly low times, but they don't quit. Uh, and I think, uh, that's been the lesson I've, which if, if you still believe in the market you're moving into, in the product you're creating, and in the team that you're creating it with, then even when the times get tough, you keep on going and you'd be grateful for that great team. You'd be grateful for that great market opportunity. Uh, you know, here's a perfect example. The, my, my new venture at Venue, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I'd had all these great meetings with, with record labels and artists who were loving what we were doing and wanting to get involved. And then for a week, it went quiet. And it's like everything just stalled out and it stopped. And it's very easy uh, to, to get down when all of a sudden it feels like you've lost your momentum. But then literally on Thursday and Friday last week, you know, Interscope Records came on board and Epitaph Records came on board and it all started to line up and get moving again. And I just remembered, that's right, that was, just a, that was just a bump in the road. It was a lull. And lulls will happen and you can't let it uh, defeat you psychologically. I think lulls will happen, but they sure didn't happen in this interview so far. And they won't happen, I'm sure, when our students get to asking questions. So I'll ask you to hold on, and we'll be right back with more of The Naked Entrepreneur and Student Questions with Derek Ball. Back to the studios of Ryerson University and the Naked Entrepreneur. Tonight with us we have Derek Ball coming live from San Francisco and Derek's going to take a few of our student questions. Uh, Derek, uh, I was just wondering, um, I feel I've been studying entrepreneurship for a little while and I'm having a little difficulty finding that thing that I, I'm really passionate about and that I want to pursue some entrepreneurial ventures in. So I guess what my question is, is uh, how did you find that the tech industry is something you were just so passionate about you wanted to work in it for the rest of your life? I think uh, it's, interestingly enough, tech wasn't so much what I intended to do. In fact, I, when I went to school, I was training to be a banker. I have a degree in finance. Uh, but what I learned I love is solving problems. 
And what I found was that there's an awful lot of problems where there is a technical solution to the problem. And I think that to me was was where I found my interest. And if you look at the, the companies I've started, I've never actually done the same industry twice. So the uh, Sonic Mobility was mobile solutions, but specifically I was solving problems for military, government, and banks, people with data centers. Uh, then uh, my next solution at, at Tint, I was solving problems for people that uh, uh, in the publishing industry. So old world digital, old world newspapers and magazines that were suddenly finding the digital world was confusing them and they weren't being successful. And so uh, a different industry. Then now I'm working in the music industry. Although I love music, I've always been, I've gone to as many live concerts as I can and I love music. I have never been in the music industry. So for me, it was about, I, I found out that part of my character is I love to fix things. And when I see something broken, I just feel compelled to fix it uh, and to, or to try to fix it. Uh, and I think that – and then when, the tool set that I chose to use is the technology tool set because I found I could solve bigger problems for more people that way. And that to me was in, inherently satisfying. And so I think for you, when you decide – when you're trying to decide – what do you want? How do you want to apply your entrepreneurial uh, you know, learnings and instincts? You have to find something that satisfies you, because if it doesn't, if it's not something you're going to get personal satisfaction out of, don't just do it for the money. If you're just going into entrepreneurial instincts because you think it's going to be a way, a great way to make a bunch of money, you're less likely to be successful. You want to go into something that you get an immense amount of satisfaction in. And if you don't see that right away, just start talking to people and you'll start to see things and, and just you know, notice your own reactions. Like for me, uh, a great example is I got I was interested in the music industry because I saw revenue shifting. I can see huge problems there. And I, and I was curious about, well, if, if uh, people aren't paying for music anymore, how are artists making money? So they're making money in live performances, in uh, concert ticket sales and merchandise sales. And as I began to peel that onion and just try to understand where the money was going, I realized that there was one section of that industry, merchandise sales, which was classic Steve Blank. The, you know, there's $2.5 billion a year flowing through this industry in North America, and it's all tracked on Excel spreadsheets. And people take these Excel spreadsheets and email them around or fax them around to each other. And uh, uh, so for me, I got excited because I saw something that I could fix. So I say tune into the things that excite you uh, in terms of where you seek your opportunities. So when looking for your passion, when trying to figure out which opportunity to pursue, tune into that inner dialogue, see how you react to things. Exactly. That's great. Thanks very much, Ryan. Hi, Derek. Um, so currently I'm working for a startup company. We're a digital marketing firm, and my dad is also working for a startup company. He's just started his own business uh, two years ago. It's a solar energy company, so really the scalability of our companies are completely different. But would you say younger people or older people either or have the upper hand when it comes to entrepreneurship? So Derek, you've mentored a wide swath of entrepreneurs in all sorts of fields and locations. The question is, do you think Older entrepreneurs or younger entrepreneurs have an advantage, and if so, what would that be? I think, uh, and a lot has been written about this particular subject, especially in Silicon Valley, because uh, there's VCs that will not fund people who are over 25 years old, and there are VCs that strive to people who have to be at least 35 to get funded, although many of them don't officially list that. But if you look at the CEOs of their, and the founders of their portfolio companies, you can see it very clearly. Uh, and so is there an advantage to one or the other? Both have their advantages. The advantage of youth is is the perception of invincibility. You don't you know, you you have uh, you can risk anything, and really you can and you should. If you have a desire to take risks and absorb risks into your life, when you're young is the best time to take those risks because you don't have to be uh, supporting a lot of uh, let's uh, uh, additional costs and things that which uh, could potentially deter you from pursuing an entrepreneurial path. Did you just but, call your daughters additional costs? Three of them. <laughs> Fair enough. The, uh, What's the advantage of the older entrepreneurs then? The advantage of the, of the older entrepreneur is I think there's definitely some experience and wisdom when it comes to assessing uh, what decisions to make, what information do you need, uh, who to engage with, and uh, as well when it comes to negotiating. I see a lot of younger entrepreneurs 
uh, uh, reaching right across the table because uh, they're so excited about what they're doing, but not always making the appropriate connection with the buyer or the validator or the person on the other side because they're so anxious to sell them on what they are passionate about. Whereas the, you know, a lot of times the, the, more, uh, the older entrepreneur waits for the person to, uh, has the experience in understanding how to get people to come around to their point of view. Uh, so I see differences in how they build relationships and how they engage within their communities, uh, which I think if I was going to score points, I give those points to the older entrepreneurs rather than the younger entrepreneurs. But I don't think that one is going to be more successful than the other. They both just bring different strengths to the table. Derek, we've really enjoyed having you with us tonight. I want to thank you for being so open, so honest, and so naked. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Ball. We'll be right back. Tonight our guest was Derek Ball. Tonight we learned that entrepreneurship is a roller coaster ride and it takes a delusional level of optimism to thrive in business today. From Ryerson University, I'm Sean Wise. Thanks for watching The Naked Entrepreneur.